July 24th, 1997, I got a phone call. And some of you haven't heard this story, but... And they said, Paul, your, your father's in a very serious car accident. You need to go to the hospital right away. And it was just at that point that I wanted a good relationship with my dad, you know? Because I was away from God, just kind of in my, in my own... I love my dad. I know he loved me, but I was just kind of in my own, in my own world. And... Um, so I started driving to the hospital, St. Francis, and I, I didn't know what to expect. I thought maybe he broke his arm. Or, they wouldn't tell me how bad it was, so I was very concerned. And finally I got there, and Pastor Mike met me in the parking lot. And as we're walking in the hospital, he looked very upset, and I didn't know why he was looking so upset. And he said, Paul, he told me something i never forget. He said, Paul, today your father died in a car, in a car accident. And, uh, and I, I didn't say anything because I was in just complete shock. I didn't want to believe it until I walked into the hospital, went down a few hallways. They took me to my, um, uh, the hospital room, and they opened the door. And there on a, on a hospital bed is my father's dead body, you know, just wrapped in bandages and blood everywhere. And I just lost it, started weeping, you know. And it was right then in that moment I realized I no longer had a father. He was gone. And this church, I could literally feel you guys praying for us, you know? The prayers of the saints is a powerful thing, and you guys just really did it right. This is an amazing church. Amazing pastors. They look after their shepherds. Some of you, you need to stop saying bad things about your leaders and lift them up in prayer. Because they go before you, and they're on the forefront, and they, they take the attack for you at times. If only you would realize that. You would never speak a negative word again. You need to be lifting them up, praying for them. They look after you as shepherds. We may not always agree with their methods. Maybe we don't like a message. Maybe we don't, we don't like their leadership style, but they look after you. They care for you. As shepherds. Amen? Amen. So here I am. Sorry, I'm just like a complete mess. So here I am in this, and I was going to do a missions update. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You guys already saw a missions update in the video. So here I am at this height of this spiritual experience. And I'm just way down here. How do you deal with that, you know? I had a decision to make, and thank God that I had good teaching from Pastor Bob. That was such a mess. I was not expecting on crying. If we don't know God's nature and God's character, we will blame God for things he never did. Because God's a good God, and he has good things for his children. So I had a decision to make. I can blame God. Or I can choose to trust him with the things I don't understand. And I chose to trust him. I never blame God. And it's okay to have questions. How many of you have questions about why, why something, had, something happened in your life? Absolutely. Listen, I have questions too. And unfortunately in this life, it's okay to have questions, but we're not always going to get an answer to these questions. And you have to be okay with that. Listen, when it's all said and done, you'll get some answers, I believe. But in this life... That's why it's called the walk of the, the life of faith. The righteous will live by faith. It's a faith walk. You can trust him with your life. He's a good father. He's a good dad. The Bible says he's a father to the fatherless. He's been that in my life. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a father. Or maybe you have an absent father. Listen, I can relate to you. I don't have a father, but we have a father in heaven that loves us, Amen. cares for us. He looks after us. And I, I really believe that we've got a whole generation of young people that have no idea who they are because we live in what I call a fatherless generation. And this is a serious issue because we get our identity from our father, don't we? And because of this, we have a whole generation. They don't know who they are. And it, it's an identity issue, and it, it can manifest itself in different ways. For a small minority of people, it can come out in their sexuality. Okay, they can have some confusion in their sexuality. 
because they don't know their identity. They don't know who they are. They don't know who they belong to. For some people, it, for most of them, it comes out in their performance. They feel like they have to perform to become something in life. So they feel like they're valuable. They have to work at meat or have a, a good position or a good salary so people can recognize them, so they can have a good car or a good house. You see, most believers, I travel a lot. This year I'll be in 12 different countries. And I've been on a three-month-long missionary journey all over the, Europe. Af I just got back from Africa. My body still feels like it's in Africa. So I'm still uh, jet-lagged right now. But I would say most believers have no idea who they truly are. Maybe a small revelation. It wasn't until about five years ago that I really feel like I got more of a full revelation of who I am in Jesus and what he's done in my life. And see, if you don't know who you are, you'll act more like an orphan than a son or daughter. And we need to walk out our identity in Christ. And I'm sure Pastor Bob has seen this through the years. So many people that they get born again, they know Jesus, but they're still thinking like orphans than sons or daughters. The Bible says be transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind. Your mind. You have to start thinking differently, not only about yourself, but about God. Listen, God's not some type of taskmaster that wants to hit you every time you sin. He's a loving father. Do you know a loving father that wants to know you, that wants a relationship with you? Some of you have a wrong perception of, of who he is. Ephesians 1.5 says this, that God has predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance to his pleasure and will. Listen, God has predestined you, all of you in this room, to be a part of his family as sons and daughters of the king. So you may say, well, Paul, what does the word sonship mean? Sonship is simply the relationship between a father and a son. A close relationship or a father and a daughter. My friend, this is powerful because it means before the creation of the world, God had you in mind and he decided to adopt you into his family through Jesus Christ. Amen? I hope you're with me this morning. If you fall asleep, I'm going to wake you up. <laughs> now, in the natural, um, God's way, right, is that a husband and wife would come together, and the result is children, right? So how many of you remember my brother? You don't need to raise your hand. Never mind. I'm not. Okay. My brother John and his wife Kate, okay, they had, like, family planning. They got married. They talked. They're like, okay, let's have three children. They said, four is too many. You know, two is not enough. Let's have three. So they had child number one, child number two, child number three, and then they talked. They're like, okay, no more children because we love babies, but they haven't slept in years. And they just wanted to get some good sleep. Seriously, that's what they told me. It's like, Paul, we're not, we're not gonna have any more. And then, so they talked, like no more kids. And then five years later, my sister-in-law Kate had a surprise. We're gonna show a video in just a minute. But what happened is she was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and she didn't tell anyone. She didn't even tell my brother. And if you watch this video, we're going to see it in a minute. My brother is the one in the top and the middle in the striped shirt. So let's see what happens after five years after they said no more children. Check this out. Okay. Ready? Okay, hold. One, two, three. I'm having a baby. <laughs> No, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm capturing it on tape right now. <laughs> I am. I'm having a baby. We're having a baby. I am a baby in my tummy. <laughs> it's like, Did you hear yes. What's going on? Rick doesn't know either side. I'm serious. I'm, I'm not I'm joking. Serious. Why do you think I'm taking a video right now? <laughs> And I'm sorry, I know this is your first night. Welcome to the family. This is, I'm, so, I'm very serious. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yay! Yay! I thought you were joking, babe. No, nice save, honey. <laughs> okay, so they, 
So in that one minute, I'm watching this video. I'm remembering I was in the video. I'm in the blue shirt. I was a little bit skinnier back then. You can pray for this thing right here. So in that one minute, my brother's processing like, oh my gosh, I'm a father for the fourth time. Like he's like, oh, he's in shock. And at the end, he's like, yay, let's celebrate, you know? So then they talk. They're like, okay, no more children because, you know, we love children, but, you know, they haven't slept again in a year. And they said, no more kids. And then four years later, something happened. And my sister-in-law was feeling sick in the morning. And my brother thought she was eating too much ice cream. <laughs> because her stomach, seriously, was getting bigger. And they thought, no way, this could not be happening. Because nine years before, they said no more kids. So they had baby number five. <laughs> now, we can, we can thank God for these kids, right? <laughs> now, my point in sharing this is this. They may not have initially planned those children, did they? Babies four and five. But they were in the heart of God. And, I, and they were before the beginning of time. God wanted them to be here on this planet. And I cannot imagine life without number four and five. Remedy and shepherd. I wish I had a picture. They're the cutest kids you've ever seen. Listen, Ephesians 1.5 says this. That God has predestined us for adoption to sonship. Say sonship. Okay, so that's in the natural. Now let's talk about adoption. Now, adoption is a powerful thing. Because adoption, you don't have to have children if you don't want to. You see, in adoption, the parents choose the child. Okay? So I can imagine the father in heaven, he's looking down. He's like, I choose this one. I choose that one. I choose this one, this one. He's chosen all of you. He's chosen all of you to be a part of his kingdom. He has adopted you as sons and daughters of the king. Listen, the scripture is very clear. He no longer leaves us as orphans. He calls us sons and daughters. But some of us in this place, we've got to overcome what I call these orphan mentalities so we can walk out our identity in Christ. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we are also chosen. Say chosen. Now, let's talk about the difference between orphans versus sons and daughters. Orphans, think about orphans, okay? They've got no parents. They have no inheritance. They don't know their identity. They often don't even know who their parents are, okay? Now, if you don't know who you are, you'll live your entire, or who you belong to, you'll live your entire life by performance and the opinion of man. How many believers live their whole lives about what their neighbor thinks about them, what their pastor thinks about them, because they don't know who they belong to. Okay, you, many feel like they have to work really hard in life to become something so people can recognize them. So they feel like they have significance. You need this kind of salary. You need this kind of car, this kind of house. And many have this gnawing feeling inside them that they just don't measure up. No matter how hard you try, you're just not good enough. You're not smart enough. For women, you're not beautiful enough. For men, you're not manly enough. See, orphans, they always feel like they're in competition with one another. Comparison. What I have versus what they have. They're getting promoted at work and I'm not. And many, many... Strive to make connections. So if I can I just attach my person, if I can attach myself to this person, then I'll be someone. Because that person can take me places. Happens all the time. I get messages on a daily basis on Facebook from random strangers. Paul, I want to travel with you. Paul, will you be my spiritual father? Paul, you know, this, that. If they only know, knew, if they only had the full revelation of who they belong to, listen, you're a child of the king. Listen, you have direct access to the God of the universe. Listen, some of you may not like Trump, and that's okay with me. But we still, still should pray with him. But if he called me and said, Paul, I would love to have lunch with you. Let's get, I would love to have some lunch with him. Do you know why? Because he's the most important person on the planet. Do you know that we have direct access to the God of the universe? And we can freely talk to him whenever we want. 
And not only that, but he longs to spend time with us. Do you know that? Not, God not only loves us, but he, he likes us. How many of you believe that God loves you? Raise your hand. Amen. Of course you do. For God so loved the world. Listen, God not only loves you, but he likes you. God likes what makes you, you. He loves your personality. If you've got a quiet personality, he loves that because he made you. If you're outgoing, he loves it when you're outgoing. He loves your big nose. Listen, when I was young, <laughs> listen, yeah, it's, when I was young, I had these huge ears. Okay, I really, my head was small and my ears were huge. I remember laying down on the couch, like hoping that my, when I got up, my ears would be closer to my head. And I got teased. Yeah, I went to Flat Rock Elementary. I think it's close now. It's like a compound. I don't even know what it is. I'm not sure what happened there. Praise God. But they used to call me Dumbo. Yeah. They're like, Paul, just fly away. Just fly away. But now I love my ears. They're a little bit, you know, my, thank you for my head grew some. But I love who God made me to be. I love my ears. I love myself because he made me. A while back, I was in, maybe three months ago, I was in uh, Paris, I was, sorry, I was in Africa, and on the way back from Africa, I had a two-day layover in Paris, France. Maybe some of you have been there. And I went to this museum called the Louvre. It's the most famous museum in the world, and within the Louvre is the most famous painting in the world. It's called the Mona Lisa. You've heard of the Mona Lisa? I think you have. So this painting, it blew my mind. It's worth almost one billion dollars. This one painting. I couldn't believe it. So I could care. Listen, they had this. It was such a big museum. Like my only purpose was to find Mona, right? So I'm on this mission to find Mona. And it took like two hours because there's all these levels and like it's like the movie Inception, like layers upon layers upon layers, you know. So I finally find Mona Lisa after two hours. And there's hundreds of people taking pictures. Hundreds, and they're just memorized, just looking at this painting. It wasn't even that big, like, you know, like this big. And I remember looking, I'm like, this is really strange. Like, these people are, like, very emotional. Like, I had one friend of mine from Bulgaria. She's like, Paul, when I, when I saw Mona, Lisa, she's like, I started weeping. I started crying. I'm like, why would you cry? I mean, I think it's great. It's worth, like, a lot of money. It's valuable. She's like, Paul, she's like, you don't understand. She's like, Mona Lisa, she says, it's perfect. She said, it's a masterpiece. Do you know the Bible says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made? Do you know that you are God's masterpiece? Amen. He formed you, created you with a unique personality, unique giftings and talents that only you're one of a kind. You're worth way more than a billion dollars because he made you, he created you. He created for a specific purpose, destiny in life. Listen, stop hating yourself when God calls you his masterpiece. Stop thinking of yourself as less than. Stop thinking of yourself as an orphan when God calls you a son. And he calls you a daughter. I'm just kind of free-flowing. I just kind of forgot about my notes there. I hope that's okay. <laughs> You know, about five years ago, Pastor Bob, when I started this kind of ministry, I was a bit intimidated because, you know, I was in China. I was used to one-on-one -on -one ministry, small groups, you know, and I was, I'm like, oh my, like, literally huge crowds freaked me out. I didn't like being behind the mic. I liked one-on-one. -on -one. I liked small groups. And then I, 2003, I get all these prophetic words. Paul, you're going to go to the nations. Paul, you're going to minister before presidents. It happened in that video. The president of Burundi was at the meeting. I got to minister before president of a nation. It's crazy. I got all these prophetic words. Paul, you're going to see miracles and healings. God's going to use the nations. You're going to lead thousands to Christ. I'm like, not a chance. I didn't even believe it. I had no faith for it. And I surrendered myself to his lordship. Listen, when you lay down your life, Jesus picks it back up. He fills you with the Holy Spirit. He gives you supernatural empowerment to do the impossible. He said, I'm just Paul. I'm nothing special myself. It's like in our weakness, he's made strong. He loves to use weak people to do great things for the kingdom because then he gets the glory. 
Amen? Amen. So five years ago, when I, la- when I launched in this kind of ministry, I, five, maybe six, five or six years ago, I, uh, I was invited to speak at this revival. Okay, and it was a pretty decent-sized meeting. It was about 600 people. And, you know, I was one of the special speakers. You know, you got your picture in the banner and, you know, the whole week of this, these revivals. And I was really excited. And I wanted to do a good job. So I spent the whole week praying and fasting for the revival. So um, I go fly out to Texas. I meet the pastor. You know, we're connecting and so on. He gives me the mic. Immediately when I take the mic, I felt nothing. I felt no anointing. I mean, my words weren't making sense. I would say something like, why did I say that? doesn't make sense. I would share a story that what they weren't connecting. I'm like, man, like what's happening? It was the worst sermon of my whole life. <laughs> Terrible. And I'm, I'm supposed to be doing crusade ministry, right? So at the end of the meeting, the Lord leads me to pray for the sick. Forty people were healed in their body. Forty people. I mean, this one girl had 30% heart she only had 30% heart function, and she got it checked after the meeting, went to 100%. I mean, just crazy healings, crazy miracles. Yeah, you can thank the Lord for that. But I could not even celebrate those 40 people that were healed. Do you know why? All I could think about was my performance, how I performed. And for a week, I was depressed. I'm like, Lord, how can I do crusades if I can't even speak at a revival, and for a week, I believe the devil's lies. You know, the devil's Paul, just, just quit, just, just go back to China, at least you'll be successful. Be a youth pastor again, you're meant for small, group, small groups, not big groups. And for a week, I was depressed, and I believed the devil's lies. And at the end of the week, the Lord began to speak to me. And after I had my week of a pity party with the devil, The Lord said, Paul, you have a decision to make. You can choose to live your life by performance, or you can choose to be a son. As a son, sometimes your meetings will be good, sometimes not so good. He said, Paul, your identity is not in your performance, not in how well you speak. Your identity is that you're a son. The Lord said, Paul, you're a son, therefore, you are successful. Listen, your identity is not in your performance. It's not in your salary. It's not in how much you make. Your identity is who you belong to. You're a son. You're a daughter of the king. I'm going to share a quick story with you. A couple, ever heard of the evangelist Todd, Todd White? He's got the dreads. And listen, the guy's the real deal. I've seen him in person, We've spent some time together. The guy's the real deal. Always sharing the gospel, loving people. Anyways, so I was at this, this, this house, this small group meeting with Todd White. And as soon as I got there, I met this young man named Alex. It was kind of like an outreach, so they invited people that, that didn't know Christ. So I started talking to Alex, and he just, like, spilled the beans. I mean, he shared his whole life story with me in, like, 10 minutes. And I was shocked. I almost couldn't believe it because his story was so radical. And he'd, he'd never been to church in his life. He didn't know what to believe. He didn't know if God was real. He didn't know if God was a tree. He didn't know if Buddha was the way. Or he had no clue what to believe. Didn't own a Bible, nothing. And then he shared with this story with me. He said, Paul, I, I've never met my father. She said, when, when, my, my, when my mom was pregnant, my dad left, and he never came back. And we never heard from him again. And so when he was about five years old, he went to his mom, and he said, he said, Mama, he said, other, other boys in school have a father. Like, where's my father? And she pulled him aside in love, and she said, I'm so sorry, but before you were born, he got scared and he left, and we've, we've never heard from him again. But she pulled out all these old pictures, all these old pictures of his father when they were dating and so on. And so he always knew what his father looked like. And he would often through the years look at these pictures, always hoping that one day he would, he would meet his father. So years years go by. And he's 18 years old, and he's at a department store five minutes away from his house. And he's just walking along, and he walk, a man walks right by him that looked exactly like the man in the pictures. And he thought, oh my gosh, could it be? Could this be my father? So he ran home, drove his car home, got the pictures, went back, went up to the man, looked at the pictures, looked at them. Of course, the man looked older. 
but he had found his father working in a store five minutes from his house. He had so many emotions, he didn't know how to deal with it. So this is what he told me. He said, Paul, I would often go to my father's work, and I would sit on the bench, and I would just watch him. He said, the whole time, I was always hoping that he would somehow recognize me. He said, I know it wasn't possible, but I thought somehow maybe he would come up to me and just shake my hand and say, hello, son. But he said it never happened. And he, because of all the rejection, the fear, the abandonment, he never had the courage to go up and talk to his father. And that whole night, so he dealt with this his entire life, just abandonment, rejection, fear. He didn't understand why his father didn't want to be a part of his life. And so guess what Todd White talked about at the small group meeting? God is a father to the fatherless. I knew it was exactly what Alex needed to hear. So after the meeting, I go up to Alex. I said, Alex, what's God doing in your life? Like, what's happening? And I can tell there's tears in his eyes. Now, this is somebody that doesn't know anything about Christ. Nothing. Didn't know anything. He said, Paul, did you, did you tell Todd my story? I'm like, no, I didn't tell him anything. He's like, I, I felt like he just told me my entire life story. He's like, I don't even know what's happening right now. This is just so crazy. I, I don't get it. And I looked at him in the eyes. I said, Alex, I said, you have a father in heaven that loves you, that cares for you, that looks at you. He'll never abandon you. He'll never reject you. He not only loves you, but he likes you. And he was just weeping. And I said, Alex, do you want to give, do you want to turn from your old life? Do you want to give your entire life to Jesus Christ? And he said, yes. And I led, led him with tears streaming down his face. I led him in the prayer of salvation. And I literally, before my eyes, I saw him change. I got his contact information. I sent him a text the next day. I said, Alex, what's going on? Like, how are you feeling? What's... He's like, Paul, like, I'm not even sure what happened yesterday, but I feel like a brand new person. He said, what is that? I said, Alex, I said, welcome to the family of God. Amen. You're now a son. It's called salvation. Amen. What brought Alex to Christ? It was the love of the Father. Listen, when I was... Pastor Bob, when I first started, you know, I was in my 20s doing this, I was always evangelistic. But I saw people more like objects that need to be saved rather than a, per, a real person that has emotions, that has a real life. And God had to put his heart within me for people. And I've gone through some stuff, like my father passing away. I've been through some other things. And God, he's had to, I had to look at people differently. They're not objects to be saved. They're people that need a connection with their father. They need to be reconnected to the family. To the, they need to be connected to the family of God. Bill Johnson says this. He said, the whole purpose of heaven is to reveal the father through sons and daughters. Listen, what's your purpose in this life? Is to reveal the father. To show people the love of the father with grace and truth. There's a scripture that says, all of, this is so powerful, all of creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Do you know what this means? Eskinaba, Gladstone, they're waiting for you to come into the fullness of your identity as a son or daughter. Do you know why? So you can walk in the kingdom of God. The Bible says that you are an heir of God. Say, I am an heir of God. That's what the scripture says. It's, the scripture is somewhere in my notes. Listen, you're an heir of God. You are a co-heir with Christ. Listen, when you're an heir, what do you get? You get the whole kingdom when you're an heir of something. Jesus died for you so you could be an heir of the kingdom. And you say, Paul, what's the kingdom? It's when you preach the gospel and people get born again. When you pray for the sick, miracles happen. You, someone's tormented with fear or anxiety and they're demonized. You can pray for them. They get set free. This is what Jesus paid a price for. This is the kingdom of God. Listen, some of you are you're not walking the kingdom because you're still 
thinking like yourself as an orphan than a son, than a daughter. When, when Jesus paid the price so you can walk in the kingdom as sons and daughters, all of you can pray for the sick. All of you can see miracles. All of you can lead someone to Christ because Jesus paid the price. We just have to walk in the authority that Jesus has given to us. Yeah, it's a good place to... If you could all please stand in this place. Listen, some of you here, you need to be reconciled back to the Father. He's a good dad. Some of you, you need to stop thinking of yourself as less than. When God calls you a son. Some of you need to get your heart right with God. Listen, some of you have head, a head knowledge of God up here, but it's not down here. Some of you have to repent. Repentance is, is simple. It's a change in thinking, the results in a changed life. It means you're once going this way. Addictions, pornography, whatever it is. And you turn. Who do you turn, turn to? You turn to Jesus. You put your faith in him. You leave the past in the past. Listen, do you ever stumble and fall? Sure, I'm sure you do at times. But listen, when you come to Christ, your nature's been changed. See, some of you are still acting like sinners because you still think you're a sinner. It might, sometimes growing up, and even in Pensacola, I would hear people share testimony, like, oh, I'm just a sinner. I'm just a lowly sinner. Saved by God's grace. I'm just a worm. Listen, when you come to Christ, you go from a sinner to a saint. A saint that sometimes sins. If you still think you're a sinner, guess what? You're going to act like a sinner, aren't you? Listen, it's an orphan mentality. Listen, when we come to Christ, we go from darkness to the light. We go from bondage to freedom. You've been changed. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to righteousness. You belong to Jesus Christ. Either you're set free or you're not. Some of you need to be set free this morning. Listen, I did the church thing until I was 16 years old. It wasn't until I was 16 in July that I got my heart right with God. Changed my entire life. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I received the Holy Spirit baptism. And I laid down my life. And he picked me up. Filled me with the Holy Spirit, and He sent me around the world. Listen, I just feel such destiny and such purpose for this community. Listen, this there's been prophetic words over this church for years that this church is a lighthouse. Listen, you need to start bringing people to church every single week. You're all listen. You're you're all called to ministry. Turn your neighbor and say you are called to ministry. Pastor Bob's laughing because he knows he's called the ministry. Listen, you, and you may say, you may say, Paul, I'm, I'm a school teacher. I'm a plumber. I'm, I sell lumber. Whatever you do. My dad worked for the DNR here in, in Gladstone or Escanaba. Listen, you're all called the ministry because you are all called to make disciples. Every single one of you. Do you know what Jesus heard from his father before he ever did any ministry? Okay, imagine the, the River Jordan. John the Baptist is baptizing Christ. Comes out of the water. The Father speaks. If you could put that scripture up on the screen. The Father spoke. He said, you are my son. In, who, in whom you I love, with you I am well pleased. How many of us are trying to do life and ministry without this revelation that you are a son that you are a daughter. That God not only loves you, he likes you. Not only that, but he's pleased with you. Even when you're in a process, God can take delight in you. He longs to spend time with you. This is the love of our Father. You are my son. With you I love, with you I am well pleased. Listen, Escanaba is waiting for you. Gladstone's waiting for you to come into your fullness of your identity as a son or daughter. 
so you can walk in the kingdom, so you can see that when you walk in the kingdom of God, guess what? You destroy another kingdom, don't you? Amen. The devil hates this message because orphan mentalities come off and you begin to come alive. You begin to, to step in the fullness of who God made you to be. Destiny, purpose. If you could, I'll bow your head and close your eyes. With no one looking around. If you're here today, listen, Jesus paid a great price for your salvation. He was beaten for you. He was whipped for you so you could be set free. Listen, we deserve to get punished because we sent Jesus paid the price for you on the cross. He was beaten for you. He was whipped for you so that you could be free. But you have to make a decision. Some of you have to repent. You've got to turn from that old life. You've got to, some of you, you haven't surrendered everything. You've given him a, him a part of your heart. You see, some of you have an undivided heart. David prayed the prayer. He said, Lord, give me an undivided heart that I may worship your name. This morning, this is what's going to happen. You're not going to give Jesus a part of your heart. You're going to give him your entire life. And when you pray that prayer and you let him in, he's going to make all things new. So in just a minute, on the count of three, if you need forgiveness, if you need Jesus to set you free, listen, let go of your pride. Jesus is right now is knocking on the door of your heart. Listen, I wish I could do it for you. You have to open the door. You have to let him in. When you let him in, he's going to change your entire life. So on the count of three, if you need forgiveness, one, don't wait or hesitate, one, two, three. If that's you, raise your hand right now. If there's anybody else, if you need forgiveness, raise your hand right now. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care. Raise your hand right now if you need forgiveness in Jesus' name. My friend, this is the wonderful Jesus. Okay, so that's group number one. Group number two. If you find yourself with, listen, it wasn't until five years ago that I really overcome lots of these orphan, I'm still working on. But if you need grace in overcoming these, some of these orphan mentalities, maybe it's performance, it could, be, it could be a list of things, but if you need grace and you realize that you need to get rid of some of these orphan mentalities so you can walk out your identity as a son, if that's you in the comment for you, raise your hand. One, two, three. And there's many, many hands going up in this place. Let's just stretch up both hands to Jesus right now. Everybody in this place, just raise up your hands to heaven. Listen, if you if you raise your hand for salvation, listen, pray. You don't have to do it out loud. Just from your heart, just say, Jesus, I give you my entire life. Say, Jesus, I surrender my entire life to you. Listen, he's going to come in. He's going to set you free. Just, just, just say, Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I lay down my life. Say, Jesus, take control of my life. Forgive me. Set me free. I put my faith and my trust in you. For group number two, say, say you need to start making declarations over your life. That I Say things like, I am a child of God. I am a co-heir with Christ. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I want you to just, just, just take the next few moments. We're gonna play a song called No Longer Slaves. Cause you're no longer slaves and I want you to spend time with your father. And then I'll pray and we'll, we'll close out the meeting.